Hi, I'm Amy Elias. I'm the director of the UT Humanities Center, and I have the pleasure today of introducing two special guests who are visiting our campus. Uh, Vinton Cerf, who is the vice president of Google and, uh, and, and its chief evangelist. Chief right? internet evangelist. Chief internet evangelist. <laughs> um, and the inventor of the internet. And also Michael Whitmore, who is the director of the Folger Shakespeare Library. So I have one question for you today, which is, how do you feel about, or what could you say about the relationship between the sciences and the humanities today? A scientist and a humanist in the that's same right, That's exactly the right combo. Well, since you're the humanist in this picture, let's start with you. Like, what's your general sense right now? Are the right sciences abandoned the humanists? No. I think we used to be alone on our island, and we never got to talk to people like you. But the fact that we're here together says something. It does. Uh, years, decades ago, C.P. Snow said, the sciences, the humanities, two cultures, they never talk. It feels now more like we're complementary halves. We, we talk a lot. And I think it's important because the scientists need to have some sense of their history and some sense of what they do does to society. So you can teach us a lot. I'm listening. Well, you know, I could learn a lot from you, but on our side, what I would say is the story of how humans figured out how to be ourselves. They are stories that you can learn better from art, from history, and that's what we teach. So that's why when we have people studying science and the technologies, they also need to study literature, art, and history. Otherwise, they won't even be able to project the consequences of what they do. I mean, as the, one of the co-inventors of the internet, I certainly did not 40 years ago understand all of the implications of that technology as it gets into everybody's hands. Think and so. now, That's where it feels like we're on the same island together. Well, here's the island that we're sitting on. It has a computer on it <laughs> because the fact of the matter is that science is now computational X. It's computational biology. It's computational astronomy and so on. Let's talk about computational literature. Let's talk about computational humanities. Let's think a little bit about what it's like to have text that's accessible to software. And that's something you're really excited about. I, I'm excited about it because once you can grab onto the words with a computer, piece of computer code, you can then start to put the words together with pictures, audio, stories, testimony. But in the old days, I think it was a book and a human being who had to make those connections. Now we can support those connections and tell those stories in richer ways. Well, and imagine writing little three by five cards and trying to do that by hand. So I have this interesting theory that, or maybe it's a belief, that once we get the texts in this uh, computer accessible form, uh, we can present it in so many different ways, related to so many other texts, in ways that you could physically not do. You'd have to have a room that's 10,000 times the size of the Folger Library to have all the text that the computer can touch its hands on or put its hands on. So I, we have this energizing way of helping people deeply appreciate what it is that they're reading. Yeah, I agree. And uh, the fact that we can do it for the people who want to see it and deliver it in ways that really speak to their story is what's so exciting. It's, it's not only public, but it's personal. Yeah, I can hardly wait.